Hello everybody, this is Tim once again with my review for Halloween 6, which I just recently watched. Um, here I have it on VHS, just like uh, my other Halloween films, I'm a collector of VHS tapes. Uh, the scariest Halloween of them all, Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. That's bullshit, this isn't the scariest Halloween film of them all. I will say though that it's a... Uh, it's much scarier than part five, and it feels more well made than part five, and better directed than the fifth one. The fifth one felt kind of cheap, and almost had like a kind of a directed video feel to it. This film feels no more feels more professionally made, and feels like they had more money behind it. Uh, the film stars Dawn Pleasance once again as Loomis, uh, Paul Rudd playing the adult Tommy Doyle, um, Marina Hagen. And Mitch Ryan as Dr. Wynn. Okay, uh, let's jump right into this film. This is, of course, what ends up happening in all horror franchises. This is the origin story that we get in all horror franchises eventually for uh, the character. Or not so much the origin story, but the discovery of how why they are the way they are. We get one of these in every, every franchise, or at least for the major ones. Like, we get one for... Um, Freddy Krueger with a Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead, where he's got the dream demons that give him his power. Jason Goes to Hell, we got kind of like hints at the Necronomicon and the little demon baby inside of his body that houses his soul. We get that with Jason. And here we get a constellation <laughs> for Michael Myers. Um, the whole idea about Michael Myers be powered, being powered by a fucking demon who's represented by a constellation makes him seem more like a vessel for evil instead of evil itself. Like, not so much a pawn. Like, I know some people don't like the idea of the cult and stuff in this film because it makes Michael Myers seem like a pawn. But he's not more like a, he's not so much a pawn because the cult is more like working with him and trying to protect him. He's like their muscle uh, in the film. Uh, but uh, the, the the idea of him just like more like happy in the, the body or the vessel for the evil uh, more than him being the evil himself makes him seem more like a... Um, more like he's slightly being used, which uh, which I don't like. <laughs> but uh, if you can get past that, the film isn't. If you can get past the idea of Michael Myers not being not starting out, not being born himself pure evil, but becoming pure evil, uh, then uh, you can enjoy the film somewhat. <laughs> I'll be right off. This is not a great movie. I wouldn't even say it's a good movie. This is only an okay movie. It's borderline suckage, just like um, uh, Season of the Witch. Uh, it's better than Halloween 5. It's still not as good as Halloween 4 or Halloween 2 or Halloween 1. It's on the same level as Season of the Witch, for me anyway. Um, it's borderline suckage. Uh, you got Paul Rudd in this film. He plays the adult Tommy Doyle, the character from the first film that Laurie was babysitting. Um, he's fine. He's the highlight of the movie. He's pretty much the hero. Dr. Loomis doesn't do shit in this film. There's no reason for him to exist. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and there's no reason for him to be in this film. He does nothing, and I love Dr. Loomis. I'm a huge fan. He's my favorite character, but he's useless in this film. They would have been better off just not even having him in here. Uh, but, um, I know when this film was, was put together, when, uh, when they were done with it, they showed it to a test audience, and it was a real stupid test audience, and they complained about it. And uh, they went back and filmed complete new scenes and changed like plot, uh, changed the plot slightly and everything, and it became a completely different movie. That being said, I've seen the producer's cut. It's a much better film. It's probably one of the it's one of the best. The producer's cut is one of the best in the film series, <laughs> which is kind of funny that he, they took one of the what would have what what's well what is the producer's cut is one of the best films in the series. They took what 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 uh, what is one of the best films in the series and turned it into one of the weakest. So. That's, I just find that funny, but anyway, I'm jumping into the plot of the film, it's been a long time since Halloween 5, uh, Jamie Lloyd and fucking Michael Myers have disappeared since the ending of the fifth film, um, I'm gonna find out there, uh, the Jamie Lloyd's been held hostage by a fucking cult, so, right there, this film tries to go back a little bit, kind of like Season of the Witch, to the more Celtic kind of thing with Halloween, which I appreciate, this film has a darker vibe, in part five by far and well and part four as well but it's not as good as part four but um so she's been held hostage by a cult she's giving birth to a baby uh she's had a son uh you don't really know who the father is at least not in this version it could be anybody i guess that really doesn't matter 
she's probably raped or something like that by some member of the cult. But anyway, so she has a baby, and uh, the what the cult is, what you kind of get from the movie is that they're wanting to make the, the well, the curse of Thorn is uh, something that the cult has. Uh, you kind of get the idea of they, that they inflicted Michael Myers with it when he was a kid. So he would sacrifice his entire family. The curse makes you sacrifice your entire family. Michael Myers has like the tattoo of the symbol on his wrist. And it makes you want to like, it makes you sacrifice your entire family to Thorn or whatever, something like that. So, uh, so that everybody else can live peacefully or, or the, well, something like the sacrifice of an entire like family means like prosperity or something like that for everybody else. Uh, so it's kind of like if Michael Myers kills his whole family, everything everything else would be good for other people. But he seems to kill a lot of bonus people in between <laughs> besides his family. So uh, anyway, and the cult is like trying to, well, you get the idea that they're the ones that put it on him, but not so much that they're believers in it. It's like for the first half of the movie and the second act, they're, the cult is kind of like, you see, get the idea that they are believers in the thorn. And that they're uh, working with Michael Myers. Then at, by the end of the third act, you get the idea that they're not really working with Thorne. And they're just kind of like trying to exploit the power. And that they may have put it on Michael Myers, just using him as a subject, just for a test to see if it worked. And trying to see what they can do with the power of Thorne. It's kind of like they had a... You get Well, basically what you get here is that the, the first two uh, acts of the film and half the third, that they were going for a certain story. And then when the test audience complained, they had to go rewrite it and change it. Somebody probably complained about the whole cult angle or didn't understand it enough or something, and they went and rewrote it and changed it to them just being people that wanted to exploit the evil instead of instead of uh, actually trying to work with it or help it. But anyway, um, so there uh, she gives birth. Michael Myers is showing up there uh, to kill Jamie. Um, one of the people there feels sorry for her, a nurse, I believe she is, and she gets she gives Jamie her baby and tells her to get the fuck out of there. Uh, Michael Myers shows up, kills her, rams her on a conveniently placed spike on the wall. <laughs> she fucking dies. Okay, death scene. <laughs> funny thing is, in this film, Michael Myers looks kind of fat in some shots, which is pretty funny. It's like a chunky Myers, like in between the fifth and the sixth film. He's been eating a couple too many cheeseburgers. But uh, <laughs> he, he's, I believe the actor is the same one from part five, which I think he does a better job here than he did in five. But uh, anyway, so Michael Myers kills her. He chases after Jamie. Um... Jamie manages to make it out of there. Um, she makes it to a bus stop, I think, and she gets in there and tries to call this radio station where some guy named Barry Sims is on there, and she's trying to get help from Dr. Loomis and everybody, and uh, they just kind of ignore her on the radio station and think it's just a prank or something. So Michael Myers shows up there. Uh, she, uh, you get like, you get like a the the Hall original Halloween theme is in this film, but you get like a new theme here or a musical score beat or whatever. Uh, where it's like a heavy metal guitar rift, which I actually thought was okay and a decent change up. But um, I kind of missed the original theme a little, but I, I kind of really enjoyed the change up here. I don't mind them changing it up a little bit as long as they keep the original theme in there um, for most of it. But they didn't do that. <laughs> but I don't really mind the change up though anyway. But uh, so he's looking for in there, and you get like a. This film is filmed much better than the last one, and the lighting and everything in it went hit me in dark and storming. And like uh, Michael Myers is uh, opening up each one of the bathroom stalls trying to find Jamie, and uh, the fucking sound effects, the score, is uh, played really well. Like where each time he opens one, it's like, <laughs> like a uh, kind of like a, a scream or slightly scream type sound when he opens up each one. I'm trying to find her, it's entertaining. But he finds out she got the fuck out of there. She got back in his truck. Oh, she got she managed to make it to a vehicle, a truck, before she got to the bus stop. And uh, one of the guy who uh, drives the truck was fucking uh, heading over towards the vehicle. Wondering what she was. He was trying to figure out what she was doing in his truck. Michael Myers shows up and fucking takes his entire head and twists it all the way around, and snaps it, and it's like fucking bones sticking out. It's like more of a Friday the Thirteenth style kill once again. Michael Myers is kind of a completely almost Jason fied a little bit in this film by now. In this franchise, but uh, he's not so much Jason Fied in this one that it that it takes away from him being Michael Myers. But anyway, so it's, it's still a decent kill though. I mean, the kill's fine. It's just too a little bit too Jason like. But uh, so that guy was killed, uh, and then we get back to where we was. She made it out of the bus stop, and she had she uh, Michael Myers runs her down, and she crashes at this little look little looks like a little farm. <coughs> uh, he makes it in there, and then I hate this. I do not like this at all. 
So it makes me just not, when I was watching the film, I was enjoying it up until in the here, and then I had to mark the film straight back down to zero. Jamie gets killed in a fucking horrible, brutal manner. I think is way too harsh for this character after what she's been through for two movies. She deserved more of a peaceful end or at least a, a happy ending. She gets thrown on this farm equipment and it's like it looks like a harvester. And uh, Michael Myers turns it on and it fucking just like drilling through her body. It's stuck out like that. And he goes out into the truck and tries to... And she's dead. So Jamie's pretty much gets the Rachel treatment here from part five and just done away with and wasted. Uh, the Michael Myers heads back out to the truck that she stole and tries to find the baby and the baby's not there and she and she has hit it in the bus stop and so he's fucked. He didn't get to get the baby. Um, you get Paul Rudd in the movie. He was listening to the radio the night that Jamie called in looking for help. So uh, like I said, Paul Rudd is pretty much the main character or at least the second main character after uh, the character Kara in this film, which is uh, she's a relative of the Strodes. Her and her family are, which they come out of nowhere and are living in the Myers house, which looks completely fucking different than the last movie. But, um, I don't really give, that really doesn't bother me too much that the house looks different. But, uh, yeah, the new strobes that just pop out of nowhere. You got Kara, and she's got a brother, Tim, and she's got her mom's Deborah, and, um, uh, she, her dad, I don't know the father's name, but he's like, he's a, I don't remember her father's name exactly, but. Oh, John. His name is John, but he's a total bastard. I mean, he's a complete prick. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, they get up, and oh, she has a son named Danny as well, and, uh, like, they get up in the morning, and uh, she's talking about, um, something about, uh, well, her mom loans her money, or slides her money, and uh, John is like, yeah, just keep slipping her the cash. You think going to college is going to make up for your mistakes? <laughs> and, uh, uh, He's like, uh, he looks at him and he's like, everything was fine until you and that little bastard came here. <laughs> and she goes, I only see one bastard in this house. And he slaps the shit out of her and her nose is bleeding. And then, uh, her son, Danny, has got a fucking knife pointed at him. And then that's when you get the idea that, uh, Danny has, like, got, uh, got a slightly, uh, psychotic, slightly, um, uh, psychotic behavior a little bit similar to Michael Myers. Or he's getting there. And you get the idea in the film, um, it's not completely explained but you get the idea that they're wanting to uh make the baby jamie's baby the last sacrifice of myers's family and then take the curse from myers and inflict it onto danny and then start it all over again <laughs> with someone new so um that's interesting that they can just that michael myers isn't really the only one who this can be done to or like can kill people like this with this kind of power that there's probably been people down the line has had this has had to do the same thing, but uh, like like that kind of uh, demystifies the character a little if this has been done to other characters before and he's just one in a long line. But still, if you can get past that, this movie's semi enjoyable. But uh, Tommy Doyle, his character on here, you know, played by Paul Rudd, he figures every single thing out <laughs> miraculously. He's like put together a theory about the entire thing that someone watches over Michael Myers and protects him, the man in black from the last movie who broke him out of jail. And uh, he comes up with an entire theory, and what do you know, it's 100% correct. <laughs> but I just thought that was funny that he got every single thing right. Dr. Loomis is in the movie. He's listening to the radio station that night, too. He's got a friend in here named Dr. Wynn who wants him to come back to Smith's Grove, um, come out of retirement. Uh, Donald Pleasance looks really old and give out in this movie, and he's... I like his performance here and the way they play the character much better than the way they did him in part five, <coughs> where he was just like almost like a total psycho. And this one, he's more like a laid back, sweet old man who just wants to uh, stop Michael Myers. Um, but he's not used to really do anything. He gives like his old Michael Myers' his evil speech again. It's kind of just feels like it's thrown in there just for like fan service. Uh, Don Pleasance, his character seems 100% useless in this movie. He doesn't do anything. This is all Paul Rudd right here. <laughs> but uh, I like Paul Rudd, and I like his, the way they play Tommy Doyle in here, because he's, like, been traumatized by what happened to him when he was a kid. And he's, like, he freaks out every time he sees Michael Myers and makes weird faces like this. <laughs> like, all at once. And then uh, the way he talks in the movie is really funny. Like, uh, he's on the radio station calling in at the beginning of the movie telling the... Barry Sims from the Barry Sims show that he's seen Michael Myers. He's like, I was only eight years old when I saw him. I was one of the lucky ones. I got away. <laughs> it's like real funny the way Paul Rudd plays it. And I actually like the, the way the characters played here. I find it funny that uh, 
uh, Lindsay Wallace, uh, who was in the first movie as well, the character was, was in part four, and she was normal, and Paul Rudd is plays Tommy Doyle, and he's in this one, and he's insane, or <laughs> really off the rail, but I enjoy his performance uh, as the character, and I enjoy seeing him in the film, I like Paul Rudd, and I like his comedies, and here in this film, I think he's entertaining, but uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, you get the idea that they want to make Danny, uh, Kara's son, the next, uh, next, uh, host of Thorn, um, <clears throat> He keeps seeing the man in black like every night, telling him to kill people for him. Um, so uh, Dr. Loomis learns that they found uh, Jamie Lloyd's body and that she had given birth not too long ago, and they don't know where the baby is. And uh, Paul Rudd runs into Dr. Loomis uh, at the bus station, or no, the hospital, I believe, and uh, tells him that he has the baby. And Paul Rudd, and you get funny scenes where he's like, got the baby, and he's like, I'm going to call you Steven. You like that name? <laughs> at the... Uh, I just love the way he plays it in this film, but um, yeah, he's he's great. Don Pleasance is useless. Uh, the girl who plays Kara, um, she's fine. Kara's decently likable. She fights back against Michael Myers when she needs to, so she's not just a victim. She's willing to fight. Everybody else, uh, Kara's mom, uh, Deborah, she's just a sweet old lady, really. That's all. Uh, John, her dad, is a total bastard. He looks like Fred Flintstone. He's just uh, there to be an asshole. Cardboard cut out of an asshole. Her brother Tim, he kind of seems like a dumb shit, but uh, <laughs> the actor is okay. He has a girlfriend named Beth, and uh, she's just basically there just to be there to round out the cast. The cast in this one all together though is better than the one in the and the ones in the last one. Uh, other than other than Daniel Harris in the last movie, uh, and Donald Pleasance, whose character wasn't enjoyable at all. So I'm not you know judging on acting wise. I'm judging on character wise. Tommy Doyle is better than anyone in part five other than Daniel Harris. But uh anyway, so I was disappointed that they killed off Jamie in this one. Uh, at least at the beginning of the movie. I would've, if they would have killed her off towards the end or something like that, then she would have went out more like um I don't know, more epic or something or more uh, like a sweet uh release death or something like that. Like she gets in the producer's cut with just getting shot in the head at the hospital. Then uh I would have liked that better. But uh Anyway, uh, back to the plot here. Um, so, uh, the Paul Rudd know, uh, is, well, Donald Pleasance knows that uh, Paul Rudd has the baby, and um, Kara is like a, has drawings that her kid has been drawn of Thorn and shit, and his family dead because of the nightmares and stuff he's been having, where they're trying to influence him uh, to carry the curse of Thorn. Um, you got this Barry Sims guy who's in the movie, who's the radio guy who wants to host some kind of like Halloween party or something like that for Hattonfield or something other and uh Tim and uh, Beth his girlfriend are like uh in on it with him and they want to host it with him um uh, you get a scene where Deborah is at home alone and uh fucking um Don Pleasant shows up there and he tells her that this used to be Michael Myers's house and uh he tells her that he'll he'll come back here because this is where all his memories of his childhood are from and uh he's right <laughs> he does come back uh, Don Pleasance leaves, and then you get like a creepy phone call where it's like the cold or whatever calling, and they're like, uh, we want the child, <laughs> which I thought was funny. How creepy phone calls are always good in horror films. Um, Michael Myers shows up there, she takes up running, she's outside in front of all these sheets, and it's kind of neat, and she falls down, and she moves one of the sheets out of the way, they're like hanging on clotheslines, she moves one out of the way. Fucking Michael Myers standing there with an axe, and she's like, Michael, he fucking leans back like that and just wham all at once and you get the blood shooting out on one of the sheets. I thought that was entertaining. That was a decent death. Even though you didn't get to see it, just the score like playing with it at the same time as he slammed the axe into her was in the blood splatter was made it uh, really fun to watch. So she dies like that. Uh, John comes home. Uh, Deborah had called him on the phone like uh, the day after, well, the, the day before, or no, uh, a couple hours before. When Loomis left and told him that she uh, she knows how he got the house so cheap and that he knew that this used to be the Myers house and everything that he didn't even tell him. And so he comes home and he thinks that she left him. He's uh, walking around the house. The lights are cut off and he's like acting like a dickhead again. He's like, must be the boogeyman. <laughs> Trying to be a smart ass. And well, it is the boogeyman. <laughs> he goes down into the basement. It turns out it is the boogeyman. Fucking Michael Myers surprised him, stabs him in the gut and rams him into the juice box and he gets electrocuted to death which I don't mind but then they get another over the top kill that just does not fit for the Halloween franchise his fucking head explodes completely obliterates and I'm just like 
okay, overkill here, way over, too overdone. <laughs> but anyway, so he's dead. So the bastard Fred Flintstone wannabe is dead, or look like. Um, so you go back to the Halloween party here where they're all having it. Tommy, the, well, uh, Tommy befriends Danny in the movie. He makes friends with him and takes him over to his house, and he's like hanging out with him because he doesn't want him to go back to, to his house, which is the Myers house. Because Michael will show up there and he knows it. And uh, Tommy has like a, a fucking. Uh, um, he has like a stuff he uses. He has a. Well, he spies at the window, I'm trying to say. <laughs> and looks around. At, he has a telescope. Fuck, I don't know why I forgot that word. Fucking telescope that he uses to look around and spy on the neighbors and everything. And, well, the Myers house, anyway, because he's so obsessed with Michael Myers. He even like has him on his computer. <laughs> And uh, Kara um, goes over there to Tommy Doyle's house and fucking, uh, well, they're in the Myers house first, but uh, he's he's in the Myers house with uh, with uh, Danny, and uh, Kara comes home, finds him there with him, and she's wondering what's going on, and they tell him her mother wasn't there, and then they go over to Tommy Doyle's house, and he, basically, he's got his telescope over there and everything, where he's been spying on the Myers house, and he's got, like, Myers shit hanging all over the fucking walls. <laughs> He tells her his theory about how he thinks somebody watches over Michael and protects him and shit. Uh, and that's basically the cult. <laughs> um, Danny hears voices of the man in, uh, man in black, which makes him want to go over there to the house. But uh, before that, you get a... Um, at the same time, you got the Halloween party, which Tommy decides to go to. Um, to meet uh, Don Pleasance. He goes there to meet Don Pleasance, who's supposed to meet him there at the party. Uh, he's there at the party walking around, uh, Barry Sims acting like a dick, saying he's going to go to the Myers house to, for his show, because he's doing, well, basically a Halloween show on Michael Myers. He goes out to his van, um, uh, Michael Myers is fucking in the van for some unknown reason, and stabs him in, stabs him in the van and kills him. It's okay, I mean, it's just a stabbing, but I'm still wondering why the fuck is Michael Myers in this guy's van, but whatever. <laughs> so he's dead. And then after that, you get a scene where Tommy Doyle is walking around. This little girl's like, it's raining red, where she's like getting blood dripped on her. And Paul Rudd looks up there and fucking in the trees, hanging like dude, Barry Sims' body with fucking Christmas lights all over him. It's a bit over the top and theatrical, but I actually enjoyed it. I didn't mind this. And his body just like falls down, hits the ground. And then Donald Pleasance runs into him. And uh, they decide to head back, head back to the house. And, uh,. That's when uh, Danny is hearing the voices or whatever, the man in black telling him to come over to the Myers house. He heads over there. Uh, Kara sees him disappear. She heads over there to find him. Michael Myers is, of course, in there. He tries to kill him. She, uh, her mom's body, like, uh, uh, she finds her mom's body. Michael Myers takes the axe out of the body. She manages to get the jump on him, knocks him down the uh, stairs from behind with a, uh, <clears throat> Well, she made with a poker. She manages to knock him down the stairs with a poker. I was trying to remember exactly what it was she used to hit him with. She manages to knock him down the stairs. He falls down there. Of course, he's not dead. She goes down there. Danny's standing on one side of him. She's on the other. Typical horror movie cliche here. She's got to get him to the other side. She reaches over and gets him, gets him over there. Michael Myers wakes up though and starts fucking squeezing her ankle like really hard, like you hear a crunch and it's so like shit that hurt. That sounds like it did. But uh, she man she hits his arm with the poker and he uh, hits his uh hits his hand anyway or his arm. He hits his arm. He lets loose. So they take off running and make it back over there to Tommy's house trying to get in. Uh, Michael Myers is following him. You get that heavy metal guitar beat, uh, which sounds actually sounds really good here. Um, oh, fuck. Once again, before I forget, again, I just watched this film recently, uh, and for some reason I'm forgetting some of it. I guess because the film's not that good, or at least this version of it ain't that good is the reason I'm forgetting some of it. It's only slightly better than Halloween 5, and it's on the same level as Halloween 3. Um, but, uh, Tim and, uh, Beth came home to the Myers house, and they're there, they fuck, and then, uh, Tim goes to take a shower, fucking, you get a cool death scene here where Michael Myers comes up behind him, and, uh, grabs him by his hair, and fucking, like, slits his throat, and, like, drags him back into the shadows, it's really cool, and actually well done, and then you get, um, uh, Beth is talking on the phone to Kara over there at Tommy's house, and, uh, Kara's telling her she needs to get the fuck out of there, and, uh, Michael Myers walks in the room, just, like, stabs in the back, like, swings like that multiple times in the back, and all through this movie, you get, like, these weird, uh, music video style cuts, where it's, like, flashes of, like, random, uh, little scenes of the movie spliced together with a weird, like, strobe light looking effect, 
and it's not really needed, but here I think it plays good because it like flashes like three times or something like that when he stabs her in the back. So it makes it seem more brutal. And then that's when you get uh, Danny walking over to the house, and then she has to go get him. And then you get another little creepy little uh, scene here that I almost forgot too, where the she sees their bodies laying in bed. She pulls out the blanket, and they're like all bloody and shit, mutilated, and she <laughs> throws the blanket back over top of them, and it's got that great uh, creepy score playing. Um, this film actually feels like it could have been a lot scarier than what it is, but as it is, it does feel much scarier than part five and, and part three, <laughs> even though it winds up being just as good as part three, which isn't saying much, but uh, scary wise, I think it's scarier than part three. But uh, after that, then uh, you get back to where I was um, and make it back over to Tommy's house. The baby has disappeared. Uh, but you find out Dr. Loomis had told one other person, which was Dr. Wynn, which was his friend. And then you find out that Dr. Wynn is like down there with Danny and that Dr. Wynn was the fucking man in black the whole time. And he's like an, a fucking old ass man. And he looks like he's like in his uh, late 60s, early 70s. I'm like, this dude gunned down the fucking uh, entire police station in the last movie. I'm like, okay, whatever, disappointment. But anyway, so you find out he's Michael Myers' guardian. And uh, so after that, Kara runs upstairs, and this woman who's been who stays over there with uh, Tommy in the the boarding house, I believe it is that Tommy stays in. Uh, she's the one that's babysitting for Michael Myers on the night that he uh, that he killed his sister. She explains to Kara in the movie that Michael heard a voice telling him to kill his family. So it's uh, kind of like you get the idea that she was probably the one who put the curse on him or taught him about Thorn. But uh. <coughs> So you find out she's in on it. She tries to stab Kara, and Kara jumps out the fucking window. <laughs> uh, she, uh, the Tommy and uh, Donald Pleasance, so they uh, they wake up, or Loomis, they wake up. They were drugged, and they snap out of it. They wake up from it, and they need to go to uh, the sanitarium, Smith's Grove, which is where Dr. Wynn is, and that's where the cold is. And uh, I'm not sure why they didn't just kill Tommy, because uh, Dr. Wynn really only wants Loomis because he wants him to join him, because they're like old buddies. But uh, I'm not sure why they didn't kill Tommy. He's not really wise he needed for him, but whatever. Um, so they go there to Smith's Grove. Uh, Dr. Loomis has got a gun. He goes in there to shoot Dr. Wynn. Dr. Wynn. This is when you get the idea that he just that they're not really followers. They're just trying to exploit it. So it's like the movie takes a complete turn right here. And uh, he's like, you were the first to recognize evil. That's why I want you in here. You're the first to recognize uh, the evil that is Michael Myers or something like that. Yeah. He gets ready to shoot him, and he just gets knocked out from behind. That's pretty much all all Loomis does in this movie. He's just knocked out from out there, and he never does anything else. So, so again, the character is once again the character is useless to this film. He has no reason to be here. So he's knocked out. Tommy's walking through there. Tommy finds a patient that's been stabbed, and she's like, uh, "He walks amongst this brother, and he's very angry." She's like a crazy patient. She's been stabbed in the gut. And she's talking about Michael Myers. She goes, how does it feel to be damned? And she falls over. He found her because he thought that she was Kara and she, because uh, he's seen her shadow and she like pops out in front of him and gives him a good jump scare. But uh, after that, he uh, he finds out what, where Kara's at. He goes to break her out of there. He's trying to break the door handle off to get her out of there. Um, <coughs> that's when you get the scene where Michael Myers is coming up the hallway and uh, Paul Red's making those faces like. They're funny to see, and his, his facial expressions are hilarious, and he does a great job with them. But he breaks the door handle off there and gets her out of there. Uh, they take off running. He grabs her by the hair and uh, from behind these bars, and Paul Rudd takes his gun and shoots him and knocks him down. Of course, Mike Myers ain't dead. He takes a gun off the wall and shoots him with it. Um, uh, they fucking uh, trying to find Danny. They're trying to find uh, – Kara's trying to find her son, so they're looking for him. And then uh, all at once you get a weird scene where uh, – uh, Dr. Wynn, who's the leader of the cult, he's the man in black, he's wanting to fucking, they're dressed up in kind of some kind of surgical gear or something for some reason, it's never explained, and then uh, Michael Myers just walks in there and obliterates them all with a weird strobe light in this room, and you only get to see, like, bits and pieces of him, like, hacking people and, like, going straight down on like that, throwing them through windows and shit, and it's okay, decently entertaining, but, uh, it's like with a big strobe light, and it feels more like a Friday, a psychedelic fucking Friday 13th, like, style kill <laughs> than it does a Halloween kill by far. This feels really out of place for a Michael Myers kill kill scene. But uh, it's still a really cool kill scene, despite the annoying strobe light. So they find Danny, and they get the baby. Um, they get the fuck out of there, Michael Myers. You don't get to see Dr. Wynn get killed, so you don't know what happens to him. He's in the room when Michael Myers starts butchering the whole cult, but you don't see what the fuck happens to him. And the baby is, like, in the next room, and uh, Danny's in the next room, too. And uh, Kara and uh, uh, 
uh, Tommy are both in the both hid there in the next room. And then Mike, while Michael Myers is killing everybody, they uh, take Danny and the baby and they head the fuck out of there and take off running. One of the cult, uh, one of the people who's there with the cult manages to make it out of the room. He takes off too, and uh, they manage to make it behind these bars and they close them. And the guy who uh, was working with the cult can't uh, can't get it open. Uh, Michael Myers fucking takes his head and jams it straight into it and knocks the whole bars down. Pretty good uh, gore scene here and good kill. And I've actually believed that that's a uh, I heard like uh, from trivia somewhere that that was uh, actually the guy that plays Michael Myers' dad, so he gets to kill his own dad, which is pretty funny, uh, if that's true. So uh, Michael Myers breaks the bars down, heads after him. Um, they make it to this room. Uh, Tommy's got like these fucking needles. He's gonna plan to stab My Michael with, and he acts like uh, he's gonna give him the baby. Michael walks up to him, and he fucking slings a uh, he. Uh, well, Michael gets ready to take it, and then he hears the baby crying in the background. And he turns around and he looks back at Tommy like he's about to fucking annihilate him. Paul Rudd jerks out these uh, needles and then stabs him straight into his, like, his right ear, I believe, on him. His chest. Or close to his chest and fucking injects him with, like, four of them. And it fucks Michael up and he's, like, real dizzy and shaky and <laughs> disoriented. And then uh, Kara jumps out and starts fucking beating him in the head with a metal pipe. He manages to get the best of her and starts choking the shit out of her. And then uh, Danny is uh, like telling her to go, telling him to leave her alone, and he's got the baby. And so Michael starts coming after him. And then uh, right before he gets a chance to get to him, uh, Tommy gets up and starts beating the fuck out of him with the lead pipe. Um, so he's beating Michael's brains out. Doctor Loomis, uh, well, he tells Kara and uh, to take Danny and the baby and get the fuck out of there. They head out of there. Doctor Loomis finally shows up to do something else. Finally, he shoots a little control panel. That's pretty much all he does. Shoots a control panel. They get out of there. Um. Uh, meanwhile, Paul Rudd's beating the fuck out of Michael Myers, like, in the face, over and over with a lead pipe. And then, um, so he's beating the shit out of him in the face. And then you get these stupid-ass, like, psychedelic cuts right here. They're just, like, flash, 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 flash. They're just Michael Myers' face with green shit oozing out of it. And it's, like, it looks stupid. And there's, it, the, you get a cool scene. With, uh, you get it. They see, they take a cool scene here of, uh, sorry, I had to, I had to move there for a minute. My legs were fucking killing me, but you get a cool scene here of him, like, beating the fuck out of Michael Myers, you know, like, revenge after being tormented, like, that Halloween night so long ago. But then he fucking, uh, <laughs> he goes into, like, this psychedelic, crazy-looking mode with all these flashes of just Michael Myers' face and green shit, and it completely kills the scene, destroys it. So, uh, <laughs> after that, he just throws the pipe down, heads out of there, they're getting ready to leave, uh, they ask Donald Pleasant to come with them, and he's like, I have a little business to attend to here. So you're thinking, what what's going on here? What's he doing? So they leave. <coughs> uh, so they leave. Uh, he stays there. And the next scene, all, all you see is Michael Myers' mask laying on the ground. And then you uh, hear Donald Pleasant scream in the background going, ah! Or something like that, similar to that. And then you see a uh, close-up on a pumpkin. Boom, movie's over. So it's like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> is he dead? Is he alive? What happened to him? Uh, but it feels uh, I know that I know what the ending is in the producer's cut. This ending here it was changed and it's been chopped and you know fucked with. So I'm like, uh, what the fuck is the meaning of the ending here? Were they just trying to kill him off so they wouldn't have to bring him back for a sequel or what? I don't know. Not for sure. So it makes no sense. This is a borderline sucky movie. It's a, a, just a passable two stars. Um, sorry about that burp. <laughs> uh, it's just a passable two stars. It's only slightly better than three uh, just because Michael Myers is more entertaining to watch than some old Colonel cocksucker from part three but um it's still not a very good movie the, uh, if you gonna if you have to watch one version of this movie watch the producer's cut it's a much better film and one of the best Halloween films in general so uh I'll see you guys again with a review for Halloween H2O uh my opinion here uh I know some fans like to call these three films, 4, 5, and 6, the Thorn Trilogy, which is pretty, you know, appropriately titled. Um, watch 4, uh, 5, uh, watch 4, 5, and uh, watch the producer's cut is what I'd say. 5 sucks, uh, uh, producer's cut is really good, 4 is really good. Um, try to power through 5, do something else in the background or something while it's playing. And then watch six, uh, the producer's cut of it, which ends this trilogy on a much better note. This is Donald Pleasant's last film because he sadly passed away after this film. So he put a lot of effort in all these Halloween films that he's in. <coughs> Sorry, I think my sickness is coming back finally. <laughs>
but uh, he put a lot of effort. Seems like, like half his lifespan into these movies because he's in so many of them. I feel like I've kind of grown with the character of his, you know, through all these films. So it's been really enjoyable to see him in all these movies, and it's so sad that this is his last film. At least with the producer's cut, he goes out much better, like character-wise, and with a much better film than this theatrical cut. So I feel like the producer's cut pays much more respect to him as an actor and as a character. So if you want to watch um, much better, at least if you want to watch the producer's cut for a much better ending for the Loomis character. Or a much more poetic ending. Not so much a happy ending, but a more poetic ending. And definitely a better ending than what you get here. Then watch the producer's cut. But, um, yeah, this film's not very good. Uh, I'll see you guys again with a review for Halloween H2O. And once again, I say if you're going to watch the Halloween films, watch 1 and 2. Stop there. Even though I like 4 better than 2, there's still no reason for 4 to exist. 3 sucks. Um, or is it, or well, well is it at least is it a bad movie. Um. <laughs> If you uh, have to watch three, watch it knowing that it's not a very good movie. It's just something to kill time, really. Uh, four, if you have to watch another one, um, the, the Loomis story is pretty much wrapped up in the second one. The, and uh, the Loomis, Lori, and Michael Myers story is wrapped up in the second one. So there's really no reason to keep watching any of the films after that. But if you want to watch another one, watch part four. Which is, uh, you could see that one is kind of like the ending of the Myers, Michael Michael Myers legacy a little bit. And kind of like the continuation of it with the Jamie character. Even though that's ruined in part 5. But, uh, that's more like a revamp movie though, really. So you could just, um, uh, you could more just consider the ending of the three characters of Loomis, uh, Michael and, uh, Laurie with just like the, it's considered that like the trio and the main story of just the first three movies and just let it in. I mean the first two movies and just let it in there. Three is a movie on its own, and four is a fresh take and a new take. So, uh, if you enjoy, like, I see the first two movies as their own set, and then four, five, and six as their own set. <coughs> so, with four, five, and six, watch four. Uh, five, try to power through it if you can. Uh, six, stick with the producer's cut. So, yeah, my score, final score for this film, like I've said, is uh, uh, just a passable two stars, almost as bad as Halloween 3, but not quite there. Better than Halloween 5, though. Uh, and Paul Rudd's the shit in this movie. <laughs> I'll see you guys again with another review of Halloween H2O. So, uh, once again, I hope you guys have a happy Halloween when the day comes around.